Welcome back. Now that we've configured our application to connect to our MySQL database, let's go in and start writing some Java code. And in particular, we want to write some code that will allow our event objects to be stored in that database. So I'm going to go to my project panel on the left and go down to my models package and open up the event class. This is one of the, at this point, the only uh, object in our application or only class in our application uh, objects for which we want to be stored in the database. These are the this is a the business data of our application as we've used that term earlier. This is what our application is about. It's the things that we want to keep track of. So far, when we've been running our application, uh, our our data has been stored just temporarily in memory using this event data proxy, this event data layer, which just keeps them in a um, in a in a, in a collection uh, that uh, allows them to be retrieved. And every time we start and stop our application, we lose that data because it's not stored persistently in an external database. So we've now configured our app to connect to the database. Let's uh, tell Java and Spring Boot specifically how we want instances of our event class to be stored in that database. The first thing we always do, um, and this is uh, similar to what we've done with other special types of classes in Spring Boot, is we need to add an annotation to this class to tell Spring Boot that this is a persistent object. And that annotation is entity. So um, the entity annotation from the JavaX persistence package is a special annotation that basically flags that this is a, this should be what's called a persistent class. Um, persistent class and entities, those are synonyms, and so we'll use those interchangeably. And both of those terms just mean that uh, event objects can be stored outside of our application in a database. And so um, that's the bare minimum we need to make this class persistent. The next thing we need to do is to tell Spring Boot, which um, which uh, field in our class is our primary key field. So uh, you just learned about relational databases, and you know that keeping a primary key field, and usually that will be a, an integer field or an integer column, that is a, a best practice and something you should always do, especially when working with persistent classes uh, in a web application. So we actually already have a field in here that's kind of functioning like a primary key. Recall that we created this ID field that we were uh, sort of auto updating or auto uh, setting every time we created a new event object. So the first event object we created got set to ID one um, down here in our no arg constructor. Our second event object got ID two, et cetera. And that basically gave us a unique ID for every single instance of an event object. So this, this field is, is actually functioning very, very similarly to a primary key. And uh, so we're not going to get rid of it. We're just going to rework the way our class is using this ID field. And so in particular, um, I'm going to make some room above this field, and I'm going to put a couple of specific annotations that tell uh, our application that this is a, this should be considered a primary key. So first is the ID annotation, so at ID. And then below that, I'm going to use generated value. And the first one says, hey, this is a primary key. Uh, the second one says that it wants the database to generate the values of our primary key. In other words, we don't need to do this business where we're keeping track of a little counter and updating it, etc. We're just going to let the database generate a primary key for us. So um, with that in mind, let me go ahead and delete the code that was used to auto -gener or to, uh, to, to manually set this key that is now being auto-generated. So I'm going to delete the next ID field. Down below, I'm going to go into this new art constructor. I'm not going to delete the constructor itself. We still need this constructor hanging around. Um, and we'll talk about uh, exactly why in a little bit. But we always need an empty or no art constructor within uh, a persistent class or within an entity class. So I don't want to delete the whole constructor. I just want to delete the code within it. And uh, I can also delete this line that calls that no art constructor from the main constructor. Since this one's not really doing anything, it's not creating the ID anymore. Or it's not setting the ID anymore. So I can do that as well. Okay, let's see, are there any other errors? I don't think so. So that looks okay. So this is the bare minimum we need to, uh, to make this event able to be stored in a database. There's one more thing I wanna do before we start our application and see what the result of this code is, is I wanna create uh, a new special data layer. So this, this data layer we've been using, event data, is kind of very specific to the way our application is written. It's storing events in a hash map and it's providing uh, a couple of methods to retrieve or add events to that hash map, we're going to stop using this very quickly. So um, the reason why we use this, beside the fact that it's a best practice, it extracts data management code out of our controller, is that it also mimics the way that um, the data layer we'll use going forward will work as well. So um, let's, see, let's see what that new data layer looks like. So let me close event data. In the same package, 
I'm going to create a new class. So right click on the data package and go to new Java class. And this is going to be an interface. All right, so select interface in the, in the uh, menu below. And I'm gonna call this event repository. And so this is a naming convention we'll use for all of the, uh, the data uh, layer classes. Um, we'll use the first part of the name will be the name of the class we want to store, and the second part will be repository. There are some other conventions that you might see. For example, a lot of Java developers will call it use a DAO for data access object. Um, that's another common convention, but we're going to use repository. Event repository, and it should be an interface. Okay. So if you forget to select interface, you can just come in and add that manually. If you forget to select it, IntelliJ will generate basically this for you uh, with the word class instead of interface. So um, not a big deal if you forget to select that. Just make sure you have interface here. And this is going to be a very, very simple class. So uh, what I want to do is I want to extend another repository class, uh, another repository interface. So let me say event repository extends, and I'm going to call this CRUD repository. And CRUD repository is a parameterized class. And in other words, it takes uh, some, some class parameters similar to like a hash map or a list would take, you know, specifying the types of things it's stored. When we create a CRUD repository, we need to tell uh, that repository interface what types of things we're storing. In particular, the first thing we need to give it is an event, the event object. This is the type of thing we're storing. And the second thing we need to give it is the data type of the primary key for that class. So just to reiterate, this is our base class that we're extending to create an event repository. So I'll show you some of the documentation for CRUD repository in a minute, but this basically contains all of the basic behaviors that we want, the ability to put objects in a database, the ability to retrieve them, uh, things like that, the ability to delete objects from our database. Um, so this will allow us to uh, interact with event objects in the database. And so I'm going to use CRUD repository as my base class. When I create that base class, or when I specify that I'm using that base class, I need to say that it's going to be storing event objects and that the primary key of those objects is of type integer. All right, and so these are two necessary parameters. And the order here matters. I sometimes forget and flip the order of these two parameters. Um, if that happens, you would get an exception when your application started up. One note that you might have, if you had some sharp eyes, you might have caught the fact that I used a uh, primary key type of integer, capital I. This is the class version of the integer data type. If you go back to our class, you'll see that our uh, primary key field, this ID field, is actually, uh, actually an int, a primitive integer type. And this is okay. This is uh, going to just mean that um, Java will do what's called autoboxing, which we learned about earlier in the class, where it automatically translates between the primitive and um, object types for uh, integer. And one more thing before I leave this class, I need to go up above the class declaration and add the at repository annotation. All right. And so this flags to Spring Boot that this should be considered uh, a repository class or a class that's going to store objects in the database and so it'll auto create one of these okay and um, there's there's a little bit of magic that'll happen here when we use this I'll talk about that in the next lesson video but for now we have all of the class based configuration that we need to make Spring Boot aware of our event class and the fact that we want to store event objects in the database so even though you know from a from an application perspective we haven't refactored any controller codes so uh, our code is not actually using this event repository. You can see that that's indicated by the fact that it's grayed out. Um, that's okay. Um, we are going to use it in the next video, but for now we have enough code in place to start our application and just make sure that things work. So I'm going to go up to coding events and go to boot run. Make sure that boot run is the last selected run configuration. If not, you can always go over to your Gradle pane and select boot run from there. And now what I expect to happen as this application starts up, we're not going to start up a browser. We're not going to do anything like that. I just want to make sure that the application starts up cleanly. In other words, there aren't any exceptions that happen when the application starts up. And the reason for that is there's a lot of new work that Hibernate's going to be doing during startup. And I'll show you some of the messages. Some of them are flying by pretty quickly right now. But you see, um, let's see, you see some of these um, Hibernate-related log messages. This is Hibernate, which is the ORM, or Object Relational Mapping Framework, doing some of the work that it needs to do to prepare to manage objects and to query uh, our relational database. We see a JPA-related um, uh, message here. JPA is the Java Persistence Annotation, or J sorry, Java Persistence API that um, is used to interact with, uh, or configure our application to interact with the database. So there's a lot of new work here, including the act of actually connecting to our database. So let me show you something 
uh, sort of cool that just happened. I'm not going to show you this in a web browser because, again, our application code is not actually using the repository yet. But if I go to MySQL Workbench and I go over to Schemas um, and I go over to Coding Events, notice, let me hit Refresh, notice that I now have a table in my Coding Events database. Before, we had just created an empty schema or an empty database. There were no tables. Now, there is an event table. And uh, this event table has several columns. It has an ID column, which is an integer primary key, contact email, which is a varchar, description, which is a varchar, name of varchar, and type, which is an int. Remember, type was the enum uh, field we, we were, we've been using to sort of categorize our events. So notice that each of these columns corresponds to one of the fields in our event class. So if we look at our event class, we see that we have an ID field. We have a name, a description, a contact email, a type. These are all things that we want to be storing and those are all uh, columns in the new table. What happened here is that when I started my application up, Hibernate scanned my application code, and it found that I had an entity class, that I had a class that I had flagged as a persistent entity. And it looked at the insides of that class, it looked at the guts of it, and said, OK, this class needs to be stored. I need a table for this class. What are the columns that table needs? And it found my, my various fields, ID, name, description, and so on. And then it used that information just from scanning my application code. It used that information to generate this table. All right. So uh, looking at our database, Hibernate said, oh, I need an event table. There's not one there. Let me go create it. And so this is, uh, if we go back to our application, and I'll open the properties file again, this is what was enabled. That behavior was what was enabled by setting this DDL auto setting to update. The setting basically says, that Hibernate should look at my application code and then look at the database. And if those two are not sort of in sync, it should update my database uh, tables and columns to match my application code. So this is a really, really handy feature. Um, it's not always going to do everything we need it to. It's not, it's not uh, so smart as to work in every situation, but it will work for us about 90% of the time. We'll be able to just say add a new class or add a new field and uh, having that setting uh, DDL auto uh, equal to update will mean that Hibernate will correctly update our tables in our database for us. Okay, so that's it for this lesson video. In the next one, we're going to go in and refactor our event controller to use our new event repository interface to uh, store and retrieve objects from the database itself.